So currently in Britain there are 10 immigration removal centres and these are all run on behalf of the Home Office by a series of different uh, companies or by the prison service. So, so there's a national system but the Home Office contracts out all of these centres either to private custodial firms or to um, Her Majesty's prison service. As contracted out institutions they have a very complicated um, governance structure. So the way it works is that um, the day-to-day -day life in a detention centre is governed by either the private custodial company who runs them or by the prison service. So that means that those companies and the prison service determine the regime, they provide the staff, they maintain the, the sort of fabric of the institution, they lock and unlock people, they feed them, they do all of those things. At the same time, in parallel to those people, there are on-site immigration officers who are working with the people in detention on their immigration cases, passing information to and from the women and men about what's happening with their immigration case. And then there's a third group of people who are very important to detainees but who are not present physically in the buildings, and they are their immigration case workers. And those people work for the Home Office and they are in offices around the country, you know, in East Croydon, in, in Cardiff, in various places. And they have the files of all of the people who are in detention. And those are the people, the case workers, are the people who actually make the decision about whether or not somebody will in fact be deported um, or removed, whether they can be released and things like that. So, so the detention centre itself has to sort of exist within the nexus of these three different groups of people plus the detainees. It's very difficult to describe a typical day in the life of a detainee because the centres do vary um, from one another. Unlike prisons, they don't have a security classification, so there's no obvious way in which they differ, but they, they do vary um, according to the kinds of staff who run them and also according to the contracts, which we can never see because they're private and confidential, but they, I understand that the contracts list different requirements for a daily regime. But essentially, um, the regime of a, or the daily life of somebody who is detained would mimic somewhat the daily life of somebody in another kind of custodial institution, such as a prison. So they are um, either locked into their room at night or into the wing where their room is, depending on the, the institution. And then early in the morning, a staff member would unlock them, either unlock their room or unlock the wing, at which point they would be able to come out and shower, um, have breakfast, and then again, depending on the kind of institution, they could either circulate around relatively freely within the walls of the institution and access outdoor space for a garden and um, the institutions all have gyms, things like that. Or if they're held in one of the higher security ones, um, they actually only have certain times of the day where they're allowed off their unit. And when in those times of the day, they can go to take um, English as a second language or an art, <coughs> or an art and craft course. They could use the, the internet, everybody in, in detention has access to computers. Um, they, can, they can take some fresh air within the confines of the institution. Everybody in detention is allowed access to a mobile phone, so on the unit or in their room they can stay in contact with their friends and family if they can afford to have a phone card. Um, but there's not really a structured regime as such, so it's not as though they're getting up in the morning and going to work and having lunch and then having leisure time. It's actually much more uh, fluid than that and much more haphazard. And the centres vary considerably, so some of them bring in members of the community to supplement their regime with yoga classes and knitting and photography. Um, in other ones, it's much more basic than that. So the idea of the quality of life in uh, criminology is that you can understand um, and judge to some extent an, uh, an institution on the basis of what it's like to be locked up in the institution. And this is actually quite difficult to do in immigration detention because immigration detention centres exist in a, in a strange connection between the present where people are living and waiting um, and the future which they're worrying about. And so although 
the quality of life in immigration detention centres, if you only look at the provision of services, is, is fine. It meets all of the human rights requirements that, that institutions have to meet in the UK. They're, people are fed well, they're, they're given activities, um, they're supported. If you add in the, their anxieties about the future, about what's happening with their immigration case, you know, maybe where their children are, dealing with, with some of the traumas that they might have endured, under those circumstances, the quality of life is actually um, rather less good. And one of the things we found in our research was that um, there are very high rates of depression of people in detention. And we think that their level of depression is connected to their anxieties about the future, not so much to the, to the quality of life in the institution as an institution, but their quality of life in terms of looking forward and trying to imagine what's going to happen to them. So it's a very interesting question whether or not detention centres feel like prisons. Certainly physically they do, or at least most of them do, because many of these detention centres are in fact either former prisons which have been converted into detention centres, or they're new buildings which have been built according to prison architecture. And there are a number of other um, overlaps with the prison system as well in terms of the staffing. I think all of the senior staff are former prison governors. Uh, many of the policies are based on prison service policies. Um, so the bare policies about suicide and self-harm are drawn from the prison service. Um, quite a few of the people who are detained have served a prison sentence previously, so there are connections there as well. Um, and so there are many ways in which they resemble and they feel like prisons. But then there are also lots of other ways in which they're really different to prisons. So, so for instance, um, the presence of technology in detention centres is quite different to prisons. Prisoners are not allowed in, in England and Wales access to computers, they're not allowed to email, um, they're not allowed to have mobile phones. Um, they have much, prisoners have much more restricted access to visits. If you're in detention, you can in principle be visited every day. Um, and of course, in prison, people are serving a prison sentence. So they know, once they've been sentenced at any rate, how long they will be incarcerated for. And within that period of time, they are given a, um, a sentence plan, which, which will sort of determine which courses they take and, and, and is meant to follow them through out of the prison walls. And that is fundamentally missing in immigration detention. So the lack of an upper end to detention means that there can be no planning of any day, there can be no planning of the period of detention, and that fundamentally changes it from being like a prison.